Well, um, I want to thank Sehan and the Captive Nations Coalition, as well as the Committee on the Present Danger China for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you today. Sehun had asked uh, the impossible, which is in my, uh, in a 15 minute talk, uh, to try to put us in the picture as to how we got where we are and, uh, and where we go from here. <laughs> that's, a, that's a Herculean task, but I thought that uh, a few observations in that direction would be useful. Uh, you know, we are, it's a sorry state of affairs that we find ourselves in, in the bilateral relationship with China, putting it mildly. Now, part of uh, this uh, unfortunate set of circumstances has been a function of decades of distraction by the United States. First, we had the Cold War, where obviously our attention was uh, focused on the Soviet Union, <clears throat> followed not so long thereafter on, by the War on Terror, uh, which took, again, our, our vision away from both Russia and China, uh, particularly China, and, uh, and obviously turned it to the Middle East and elsewhere. And I would say that um, what's common to the Soviet experience and the Chinese experience is the whole detente theology, if I can call it that, whereby we had the naive view, and many still do, that commercial and financial bridge building with adversaries, even totalitarian police states, uh, ultimately will lead to greater political pluralism within those societies, as well as greater geopolitical harmony uh, if we just stay the course. And as a result, China had 25 years of exploiting uh, our free market international trading and financial systems. Uh, while we thought this was all very clever in terms of WTO admission and others, uh, we were witnessing uh, one of the greatest free lunch programs of all time uh, for our adversaries at our expense. Uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, deserves some credit because of his hide and bide philosophy, which is hide China's capabilities, bide your time, uh, don't show your hand, Prematurely, I, there's all kinds of ways to interpret this, but it was uh, devastatingly effective uh, during his period and those leaders that followed him uh, to a great extent. It's only when President Xi showed up on the scene in, I think it was 2012, where we started to see China's true colors. Uh, here we have a fellow that, as I've talked about, is a rather ham-handed, crude boor uh, who is afflicted by terrible policy judgment, all a windfall for us, and as I'll talk about later, uh, is possibly going to save our bacon as we try to sacrifice our own freedoms. Uh, to, uh, to this totalitarian state. But, um, but it was only Xi that, that, uh, uh, really again showed China's hand in instances like, uh, the Belt and Road, demonstrating that this was a, was a, uh, a strategic initiative, nothing to do with just benign commercial and economic, uh, development. And, um, and there's a whole list that I'd like to just touch on uh, a little later. But for now, if we think about uh, what the CCP has gotten done over these 25 years or so, trillions of dollars of funds, of investment funds, from average American retail investors have flowed to the coffers of the CCP. That's trillions with a T. Uh, just think about that for a moment. 
uh, because no one then or now is paying much attention to the money. We don't have a CFIUS uh, for finance, you notice. Uh, we've never uh, tried to monitor who's coming to our markets on the part of China. Are these sanctioned entities? Are they human rights abusers? Are they national security violators of the type that are building and militarizing uh, the islands in the South China Sea? We never bothered to look, uh, either officially or in terms of Wall Street uh, diligence, which in the areas of human rights and national security is basically uh, non-existent. If you think about the scale moving on of the technology and IP theft, it's been taking place at a cosmic rate. I mean, they, they steal it, they apply it, and they field it uh, rather rapidly into their military to the point where we have a near peer competitor now uh, militarily, uh, which is uh, a stunning turn of events in terms of our giveaways uh, uh, in the history of, of the human condition, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we have allowed them to corner markets, witness rare earths, lithium, cobalt. I mean, we could go through a list of those. We've allowed them to compromise countries and capture them. Not just that, but regions and even continents, if you look at Africa. And uh, the inordinate influence even in our friends in Australia. I mean, the point is that the Chinese create a fearsome levels of dependency as policy. I mean, they excel at this. And as soon as you think that it's too good to be true and you're doing brilliantly with subsidized financing and vertically integrated uh, deals, package deals, uh, where it just takes space, for example, they provide the satellites, they provide the launch facilities, they build the ground stations, they provide the operating personnel, uh, they provide the training, and again, 100% subsidized financing at, uh, obviously, by definition, below market rates. Uh, you know, a dollar down gets you a space sector if you're Belarus or Bolivia, quite literally. And that's how they do business. You only find out later that they expect you, of course, to, do, to tow their line in every multilateral fora uh, as to what they believe uh, the governing principles and behavior and norms and standards should be uh, for the global space domain. They collect you know, right now, 69 countries that are voting with them in this way. We're not even fielding opposition to this kind of thing. We, we're seeing this as normal commercial activity. I mean, today, after all we've experienced in terms of being taken to the cleaners, it's hard to believe that we're still buying into the same gambit again and again and again. And you might ask, why? How can that be? And I'll give you the answer. It's greed, number one. It's short-term thinking, number two. It's naivete or outright stupidity. You can't, you can't exclude that. And that's where we sit. But I can tell you that it's a cynical business on the part of the, those that know better and it's the, at the root of this, uh, of this problem. So, you know, human rights abuses have gone unchecked, as we know. It's not even part of ESG when you look at the Wall Street world. Uh, they never deign to include national security. I mean, that's somebody else's job. Or human rights, well, heaven forfend, we try to judge what is human rights and is that going to restrict our ability to invest in some of our favorite Chinese companies? Hell no, we're not going to play that game. And so that's, as I said, part of the litany that we're looking at. They don't obey international rules of the road, uh, whether it's WTO or elsewhere. There's no social, there's no corporate governance. There's no transparency and disclosure. There's no rule of law. So you can forget about those things, and yet we look the other way. 
because companies think they're going to sell that billion widgets uh, to this illusory group of Chinese consumers, we're still buying into even that canard, which is, which is a sad state of affairs. Now, given again the limited time, I would just go to some good news. And the good news is that just as we seem intent on compromising our basic freedoms and fundamental values at the hands of the greatest existential threat that our country has ever known, riding to the rescue, uh, as I'll get into this a little bit later, are the following issues in play. Quick, very quick. Let's talk real estate sector of China. 30% GDP. 60% of the revenues of the provinces. 60%. What do they do? They, all they did was sell land to the Evergrands and others to fund themselves. You know they're already destitute now. They're getting bailouts from Beijing now. The provinces are on their behinds. How do you lose 60% of your revenues and stay a going concern? What about debt to GDP ratio? They say it's 300. Let's try 325 to 350 conservatively when you think of shadow banking and off balance sheet uh, activities, which are bountiful to say the least. Look at the COVID zero fiasco. Providential in a way. I mean, they got stuck on an unworkable policy there. Thank goodness they've had to maintain it through the party Congress, you know, every day is a gift for us that they stick with COVID zero. And then there's the missteps with Putin, not exactly an ideal bosom buddy uh, in the midst of his own genocidal campaign in Ukraine, not to mention that natty problem of currently losing. Uh, you saw that today that he wants to race through those annexations of Donbass and done yet so that he can legally pursue uh, tactical and battlefield nuclear weapons. So you'll be hearing a lot more nuclear saber rattling soon on that. But I would argue that's not so hot for President Xi because he's attached at the hip to his no limits partnership with Russia. It was just a bad idea. Uh, so and the drought and the plummeting growth rate. I mean, all these things are creating slow motion economic implosion for China. And that, in my opinion, is being accelerated. So we could go on about um, other aspects of what she has done, centralizing corporate CCP, as I call it, uh, costing a, tri a trillion five hundred billion by going to going to war with the tech sector. Uh, education and gaming sectors, uh, crushing of Hong Kong's freedoms, etc. So she has advertised the bullying, aggressive, belligerent attitude of China uh, more forthrightly than anyone else. So what do we do in the balance of time uh, legislatively? Now, I, I pay a lot of attention to the money because I think the money is the least discussed uh, linchpin to the CCP remaining a going concern. And again, without those multi-billion dollar, multi, sorry, trillion dollar flows of funds from unwitting American retail investors into the coffers of the CCP, they cannot make it. I mean, you talk about, you know, like what's, what's China going to look like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now? I don't think that's happening. Three to five years, maybe. But I can tell you, if we ever stopped the wholesale bailout of that failed experiment over there, things would move quickly. This is a real-time world, and the markets are ferocious. You know, when they reach a tipping point, and they see more risk than they see gain. When they do more short selling than long selling, that's the beginning of the end 
for Xi Jinping and company. So I think that that day may be coming. And so what do we need to do to get on top of things uh, for a change here? And one is, and I'll name the coalition because it says it all, no TSP for the CCP. I mean, the thrift savings plan is now has 35 Chinese companies in the international fund of the TSP that seven, eight million American federal employees are probably holding as well as our military. Hundreds more bad actors, including sanctioned Chinese companies, are part of the TSP's mutual fund window. That's coming down the pike at flank speed. And um, we need to harmonize sanctions. You know, again, you've got 500 Chinese companies on the entity list prohibited from selling, uh, be, being sold American equipment and technology because of their egregious human rights and national security abuses. And yet, how many of those are on the on the OFAC list that you can't you can lose access to our capital markets? Thirteen. Thirteen out of five hundred. Is that is that denote seriousness? No, it denotes a revolving door at Treasury, the SEC, and the NEC that are not serious about trying to protect American investors and ensure proper fiduciary responsibilities, much less defend our fundamental values and human rights policies and our national security. Now, and the last thing I would mention before Sehun takes out the cane here is A shares. It sounds exotic. Uh, these are shares that are bought right out of Shanghai, Shenzhen, and, uh, and uh, sorry, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Beijing all have exchanges, but it's the two first ones that are the big ones. Anyway, catch this. There are over 4,000 A-share companies in the portfolios of the American people. We have the data. We can prove where they are, which indexes are carrying them, which index funds are carrying them, BlackRock, Fidelity, State Street, et cetera, et cetera. These A-shares avoid scrutiny entirely. There's no diligence performed on them. Many of them are sanctions violators, and yet this is all done with impunity. Not one Chinese company in the American markets today is compliant with federal securities laws, not one. And yet the free lunch program goes on. So I would just close by one sentence, which is that I think that we may be facing here the greatest financial scandal in world history. This is the multi-trillion dollar underwriting by a democracy, notably our own, of a totalitarian police state bent on our destruction, aided by greed-driven Wall Street firms, and at best, conflicted U.S. government regulators, primarily at Treasury, the SEC, and the NEC. So with that sobering statement, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Ennis. Thanks.